they were going to have something so about that. Holy God, when they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so the gospel is the same message that's articulated a bunch of different ways. And the human heart is one that, that's the only way the human heart can be persuaded of something, by hearing and continuing to hear, Yeah. right? You hear and you keep hearing. And then that message just keeps piercing the heart in all the different ways that the heart can be believing and all the different perspectives that the heart can be believing from. And it keeps hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And we would call that today propaganda. We would call that being propagandized. Yes. Right? Whereby you see if you want someone to believe something, you hit them repetitively. Right? With information, with data, with images, or whatever. Right? The media knows that. Right, sure. right. Thank you. Absolutely. The media, every form of, of media knows that. Politics understand that. They, they understand how, they don't understand, like, from the God perspective, they, but they see with humans, right? If you want them to believe something, you repetitively exactly. tell them something. Sure. We right. see that in the church. Like, why do we all believe about God what it is we believe? Where did it come from? And why do they believe it? Right? And you start seeing a repetitive kind of thing. And Jesus would call it the traditions of man. Yes. Right? So when Jesus comes and said, the traditions of man make the word of God of none effect. What is he saying? Over a period of time, a repetitive lie mixed in with the word of God will make it of none effect. Yes. Right? And the, the Pharisees were kings of that. Right? Woe is you, scribes and Pharisees. You do what? You broaden your, your phylactery. And the phylactery was that little box. And what you were supposed to do in that little box is you were supposed to roll up the commandment of the Lord in that little box. And that was supposed to keep the word before your face all of the time. Well, there was only a couple of commandments that were in there. You shall have one God, the Lord your God. You shall not worship the works of your own hands. You shall remember how God grabbed you by the hand and led you out of Egypt by his strength and not your own strength. Right. And then it went in talking about the not turning away from teaching your kids so that they don't get into the land and perish from off of the land. And so there was like four things they had written on this little scroll, like a little bitty scroll you would roll up. Well, the Pharisees broadened the phylactery, meaning they added a bunch of other things onto the scroll that you had to do in order to attain to blessing in life. And so over a period of time, that whole thing morphed to such a degree, they had been such, so propagandized to the idea that blessing in life was found by you looking to the works of your own hands right. and your ability to perform and your ability to be fruitful, that it made of no effect the word of God, which is, I promise you, I will make you exceedingly fruitful by strength of my hand and not by your words. That was the word of God. That's what God said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy. The whole book of Deuteronomy is about how they're going to inherit the promised land and then not perish from off the land. Well, guess what? It's called the promised land. Guess what that tells us? There's God was going to give it to them as a gift, That's right. free from their works. Yeah. And so the whole thing was trying to tell them how they could inherit the land by way of promise. Right? Well, how do you make a promise void? Paul comes and says in Romans 4, the way you make a promise void is you try to work to get it, right? Right. And so they were busy trying to work to get the promise. They were trying to perform the works of the law. They were trying to make themselves fruitful in order to inherit the land, right? And so what that happened, they perished from off of the land, yes. right? Which is what Jeremiah come and said to Judah in Jeremiah 17, right? You brought cursing and death upon yourself. Remember Moses? He said, I gathered you this day to set before you the way that's unto blessing in life and the way that's unto cursing and death. And I told you to choose life. And now look at you guys, Judah, you've now made your own works, your food for life. Your God is your belly. You're lusting after blessing in life through your own strength, man. And you brought cursing and death upon yourself, right? Yeah. And so that that's the... The premise there, it, it, we, it, it, it's alive and well in churchianity <laughs> you bet. today. It sure is. Right? Yes. The, and, Paul, and Paul and those guys knew it. They, talk, they knew when they, when they went away that people were going to come in and the church was going to be, you know, the message was going to be splintered and the whole thing was going to get jacked up. Yeah. Right? And here we sit today with the same thing. 
Jesus can come and say the same thing. Woe is you, Christians. You've broadened your phylacteries, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You, there was one thing that was needful. It was for you to continue in the word that was made flesh in Jesus. And now you've gone off into all these other kinds of a thing, right? Yes. And now we're, we're so far off into these other kinds of things that if I just stand in front of most people and talk about the word that was made flesh in Jesus, they don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. What is it? Yeah. What do you mean? Yeah. You know, we, we don't even know what the perfect law of liberty is. What do you mean? If you ask people what the book of James is about, if you, if you, if you poll all the Christians in the world, if you ask them what the book of James is about, 90-something percent of them would say it's about how you can't just have faith, you have to have works too. Do you know what it's really about? The perfect law of liberty. And they don't even know that. They don't even hear that, they don't even see it. And then if you want to take it one step further, what's the perfect law of liberty? I don't know. I don't know what it is. That's right. Listen, man, that's, right. that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's a problem for the church, right? It's a yes. problem that we don't, that ought to be like church 101. I promise you, you ask everybody in the church the way into prosperity, they'll tell you, give 10% to the church. Bingo. You ask all of them, what's the perfect, I don't know what the perfect law of liberty is. You think it might be a little more important than the other one? <laughs> Right? Yeah. That doesn't mean we can't give, and it doesn't mean we won't give. Right. When we find the generosity of God born in our hearts, right? God will come and sow the seed that is Christ in our hearts. You know what happens when the seed that's Christ is sown in your heart? You're filled with abundance. If you know you've inherited God, you begin to think, I have all things. Right. Well, you know what happens when somebody sets before you a good thing, and you feel in your heart that you have all things? You give unto it. Do you see? That's how it works. That's how generosity works, yes. right? That's what a cheerful giver is. It's a person that says to themselves, I've inherited God, right? It's like, it's the person, remember when Jesus multiplied the fish and the loaves? Remember how they just kept grabbing stuff out of the basket? Right. A cheerful giver is a person that feels like they have one of those baskets, <laughs> right? That they can just take out of it. Sure. And they can just take out of it. And there's just more in there, right? And so when you've been, the word of Christos, is sowed in your heart. That's the seed that 2 Corinthians is talking about. When it says, and God gives seed to the sower, right. it's saying God strengthens the hearts of those that give with his grace so that they can give cheerfully knowing they have all things, right? They don't give begrudgingly or from a heart of thinking, if I give some money, then I can get some money. No, they give knowing they already have all things. Right. Right? right? And that's what, uh, to sow cheerfully or grudgingly, that's not talking about the amount, it's talking about the heart from which you give. You could give everything you got, but if you gave it from the perspective of, I gotta give for God to bless me, you're not a cheerful giver. And you're sowing sparingly. You're sowing from actually a stingy heart. You're not giving because you feel generous, you're giving because of you're thinking of what you're gonna get back. That's not generosity. A farmer does not sow seed into the ground because they're generous. They put seed into the ground because they want to get something in return. Right? Yes. Yes. Do you guys see that, that dynamic in 2 Corinthians? And one of the ways that, that, that we really make it clear is you have to understand the whole context is that Paul come and said, I want the same strength that entered into the Macedonians when they gave. Yeah. I want the same thing to happen with you. Now, what was the strength that was in the Macedonians? It wasn't that they had any freaking money. No, they were extremely in fact, poor. Right. In fact, Paul said he didn't want to take it yeah. because they were so poor. Well, listen, if he was preaching some sowing money and reaping money principle, he would have been busy telling them, hey, they were poor, but I told them they'd be rich now because they gave some money. That's not what he said. He said he marveled at the grace of God that was at work in them. What he's saying is, I see that God gave seed to the sower. What was the seed? It wasn't money. God sowed the word of Christ into the heart of the Macedonians. And even though the Macedonians outwardly didn't have anything, in their heart they believed, I have all things. Right. And so when Paul came with the word of how the Jerusalem church was suffering, and how he was going to Corinth to take up a collection from those that were better off financially, the Macedonians were like, well, aren't we well able also? Mm -hmm. to give unto this good thing here because we have all things in Christ, sure. right? And so that was the seed that was sown there. And we read so many, Michelle and I were talking about this. 
we read our definitions in so quickly and we don't even think about it, right? We're like, boom, boom, boom. And we don't even consider it. Second Corinthians 9 is a great example. We're reading the sowing thing. And then we get down to the part where it says, and God will give seed to the sower. Immediately, we think that word seed is talking about what? Money. We don't stop and ask ourselves, nor do we stop and weigh that word in the scriptures. We immediately assume we read it into the text and then we just carry on. We don't stop and weigh. We don't stop and think. But it doesn't take much weighing to get to the parable of what? The sower sowing the seed. Now, what was the seed? Was it money? It was the word, was it? Do you think maybe Paul was referring to the same thing? You see, that's how you're supposed to weigh the scriptures. The scriptures are not supposed to just be read topically, where you read a passage and you just say, well, that's a passage. Farmer passage. Right. You're, you weigh the whole body. Yeah. You're supposed to weigh the whole body together. You're supposed to consider first the word that is Christ. And then you start weighing other passages in the scriptures and how things were described and how things were said. Another example, Exodus. It talks about how the destroyer came to kill the firstborn right. of Egypt. Well, how many of you think that that's God or an angel God sent? Mm -hmm. yeah. How many of you just read that into the text? Sure. Okay, well, you get to 1 Corinthians 10 and Paul defines the destroyer as the serpent. The devil. Oh, okay. So you see how you're supposed to do this? When that happens in your heart, when you begin to know, wait a second, you're on the path to revelation, right? Most people don't want to wrestle with the scriptures the way they're intended to. They're alive. They're vibrant. They're breathing. They're like a living organism, and you can't treat them like they're a static thing, right? right? There's, a, there's a wrestling with them. There's an inquiring into them. There's a going to God. With questions, there's a, well, what, what about this? There's a whole kind of a thing that goes on before you come to a conclusion. And we don't want that. We want to read it like a novel. No, 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 I'm just going to read it like a novel. What must I do? Right? Well, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to engage with God about it. I don't want to begin to talk with God about what this could mean. I don't want to talk with, no, 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 I'm just going to read it and that's it. Mm -hmm. But you can't read the scriptures that way because their spirit and their life, mm -hmm. right? Just like Jesus said. My words are what? Spirit and what are in life. Well, what did he say there? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. See, we want to read the scriptures topically and just say, no, we got to eat his flesh and drink his blood, bro. That's what we got to do. Right? right? And we don't want to, well, what does that mean? Why did he say that? What's the context? Who's the audience? What do these words mean? We don't want to do that. That's too hard. Mm. And really, then what we're saying is we, we're not into a relationship with God. The moment we come, no, that's too much work. What are you talking about, man? It's too much work to hang out with God, right? This isn't like a mathematical problem that we're trying to hurry up and get the conclusion as quickly as we can so we can move on, right? Yeah. It's like this beautiful dance that we're engaged in with the God of all glory, the God of all creation, the ancient of days. It's this beautiful dance we're engaged in, right? Yeah. Where we get to keep having this dance and we keep getting to show up and dance and talk and, and wrestle with thoughts and ideas and reason. And through the course of doing that, man, God is building understanding on the inside of you. Absolutely. And you begin to start seeing and you begin to start the, the foundation gets built. Then once the foundation's built, it becomes much easier to start seeing. And then it starts really turning over. Like I've said that thing about James a million times. Probably Sunday is one of the best I've ever yeah, said. It's it. mm -hmm. probably one of the best that I've ever explained it. In fact, can I ask you something? Because I'm trying to, to get a handle on it. Tell me, because I've written it too many times. But explain to me again the law of liberty. The law of liberty is that God liberated us from the death that was in the world. Right? So our life was hid in the world. And then he liberated it from the world and hid it in him with Christ. So the old man is the man that was dying, married to death and bondage to death. God got it right to divorce us from that man. And then he raised up a new man. And this man was not married to death. This man was married to eternal life. Yes. Right? And so the law of liberty is how God liberated us from the world. Another way, and, and this was, yes, yes, and I was just about to say that. You have to understand James is Jewish. And so he's speaking Jewish language. 
But if you go and look over what Paul said, the perfect law of liberty would be the same thing Paul said. I was crucified with Christ. I'm dead to the world and the world to me. Right? The life I live. I'm still alive, right? but the life I live now in the flesh, I'm no longer living trying to be justified by the good fruit I can bring forth. I'm living by the faith that I see revealed in Jesus, which is my life is hid with God in Christ. It's not hid in the earth, right? The law of the spirit of life. The law of the spirit of life. Yes. And so all these things are the same, but it is to basically see my life was but dust. It was perishable. It was corruptible. It was subject to decay. It could be stolen from. It could be taken from. And then God got it right to liberate my life from just being earthy. And now my life is of a heavenly substance, the very glory and immortality of God. Right? And as you begin seeing your life in the face of the new man, which is what it means to behold yourself in the perfect law of liberty. Who is the new man? Yeah, right? Good. You want to ask yourself, who is the new man? And then you want to immediately think, What's the life that the new man has mm -hmm. right now? You want to live your life in this world, always beholding yourself and your life in the new man. Right. That's the work. The work is to continue to behold yourself in the face of the new man, to continue to behold your life in Christ and not in the world, mm -hmm. right? That's the work. Now, if you go off into the world and you look for the testimony of your life in the world, what you have, what you don't have, what you see manifesting in your life, then you're a forgetful hearer. You're beholding the word about your life that's in the world. You're trying to find evidence that your life is good from the world instead of looking to the resurrected Jesus, right? Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to testify to what you said about how to study the Bible and how to, to look at scripture. Mm -hmm. I now know why God has me on set going on Saturday mornings. Because he has brought me to the point where now I sit at that table over there for hours on end, going back and forth, picking it up here, looking over here. How does it match up with the picture? And, and using all those notes that we took from the get-go, you know, the years of notes that, you know, to go back and just to, to put it all together, it, it is truly becoming a real powerful relationship that I never, ever had before. So it, and it's, Hey, I'm, 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 I'm blessed that they haven't asked you to leave. <laughs> because it's one, it's one thing if you have, like, every once in a while, a different view. But yeah, every right. single time, every single day. you have the opposite view. <laughs> you know, listen, it, and you're just, you, you come off as much nicer than me. You're, you're kind of like Birdie. You, you, you sound calm and, and, and soft. Or I'm more like, what? Wow. <laughs> People feel smacked in the face when, when I say something, right? I would have been asked to leave by the third weekend. Brother, you just can't come along no more. You know what? I got to a place where it was like, this isn't good that I'm correcting them every time I hear. I'm very sensitive to that. And, that, and I, when, when, when I realized I kept putting them in their place every time again and again, I went, this is not good. I, I, and it, I, I had to remove myself, you know, it was like, that's why I, I had to go. I mean, I knew that. I knew, I knew my time up there was done. And You said and, what you said? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, and this isn't to say that Phil wasn't being led by the Spirit, but let each person be led in each situation differently, Amen. right? Don't make it a, yeah. don't make it a cut and kind of dry thing, no, exactly. right? In Phil's situation, he could be led by the Spirit that his time was up, but in somebody else's situation, they could be led by the Spirit to stay, right? So yeah. just, just be led by your heart. You'll, right. you'll know. And that's what I hear you saying, right? right. Yeah, you were, you were led in your heart. If I was going to teach a, a, a Bible college course on the book of James, and one of the books I have to write, if I ever get any time, is I am going to write a glossary of definitions for the words in the Bible, because there isn't that, you know, mm -hmm. right? And you... Using Thayer's and the Browns Driver Briggs and Strong's is helpful, but you also need the context, right? right? You yes. also need the context. And if I was going to first teach a class about the letter of James, the first thing I would do was give them a definition of terms, yeah. right, sure. that are in that letter. Yeah. Like one of the first things I make sure they'd understand, that the word faith in the letter of James is not talking about our faith. No. It's talking about the faith, mm -hmm. right? right, which puts the whole thing in much greater perspective. Yeah. Right? And the way you see that is you see that word faith is a noun, not a verb. <clears throat> right. 
right? <laughs> that word faith is a noun. It's not a verb. That word faith is the same thing as the perfect law of liberty. It's the same thing as the word of truth that was mentioned in chapter one. So when he gets over into chapter two and he's talking about faith, he's talking about the faith, right? And what did the faith sound like to Abraham? The faith sounded to Abraham like this. I am El Shaddai. And you can find that in Genesis 17, I believe it is. I think it's 17. Yes. Yeah. And where, where he come, where God come and said, I am the all sufficient one. Your sufficiency to appear as the father of many nations is not of you in your strength, Abraham. It's of me and my grace. And he changed his name. Right? Right. And so that was the faith to Abraham. How do we know that was the faith? Because Abraham began living as if it wasn't going to be by his own strength that he would be the father of many nations, that it was going to be by God and God's grace and strength. That's why he said, when the, the servant said, I thought you said you were going up the mountain to make a sacrifice. Where's the lamb? What did Abraham say? God will, God will provide himself as a sacrifice. Right. Then if you go to Hebrews, what does it say that Abraham believed? That even if Isaac should die, God possessed the ability to raise him from the dead, right? That's the faith that James is talking about and that Abraham continued in, right? right. And that's why Abraham appeared as the father of many nations on the mount, because that's where we hear him say those things. That's the faith he was believing in, which would be the faith that everyone after who believed would believe in. Jews and Gentiles. How do you the father of many nations? By being the father of all those who will believe on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. What was he believing on the mount? The death and the resurrection of Jesus. What do I believe afterwards? I'm a Gentile, the death and the resurrection. Tom has Jewish descent. He's believing on the death and the resurrection. Abraham is the father of many nations. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, do you know what could make Abraham the father of many nations? Sacrificing Isaac. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? You think I'm going to sacrifice my firstborn? Tom, are you going to sacrifice your firstborn? Can't do it. I, mean, I can't even do it. No. Exactly. Okay, well, that's a great example then. Neither one of us can do it. So that's not why Abraham was justified on the mount. It wasn't what he was going to do. It was what he believed. Yes. Because the whole point of being justified, justified means to be revealed to be what God said you were. Mm. What did God say Abraham was? The father, father of many, many nations. nations. So to prove Abraham was the father of many nations, God had to set the faith that was in Abraham's heart on display for everyone to see. And that happened on the mount. Yeah. So Abraham appeared on the mount as the father of many nations. Why? Because he said God will provide himself as the lamb. Do you think Abraham thought he was actually going to sacrifice Isaac? No, because he said God will provide himself as the lamb. Right. And then he believed on the resurrection. Even should Isaac die, God can raise him from the dead. Right. Do you see how he was trusting in God to preserve the promised seed and not his own works? Right? right? That would be the same thing as me now, believing on the death and the resurrection of Jesus. I'm trusting in God to preserve my life, not my own works. Right? And so that's when Abraham became the father of many nations. And Paul would describe it in Romans 4 as Abraham received strength from faith. What faith? The faith. What faith is the faith? The faith that he heard in Genesis 17 that God was the all-sufficient one. Abraham received strength from that word to trust in God and not his own works. That's why it says Abraham didn't consider the deadness in his flesh or the deadness in Sarah's womb but he glorified God, meaning he considered the ability of God, right? Now that would make him the father of all those who afterwards would also do what? Not consider the deadness they see in their flesh or the deadness they see in their own body, but they considered God. That's you, that's me, Jews and Gentiles, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You see that? Yeah. The father of many nations. That's why it starts off with God proved Abraham on the mount. That word prove does not mean test, like I'm going to give them a test and see if they'll obey. Right. That's not what it means. It means to show forth. It means to reveal or to proclaim something or to prove something by way of testing what's in it. Like you prove fire or gold, 
You burn off the dross and refine it. You refine it. So God was revealing that what he said about Abraham was true. Mm. And when he revealed it was true was on the mount. That's why it says God proved. Mm -hmm. You guys understand Abraham did not look like the father of many nations, right? Mm -hmm. He didn't have any seed. He was dead in his flesh. You see, because at, at first Abraham was a forgetful hearer. I didn't have time to get into this. But at first Abraham was not a doer of the word. No. I don't know if you guys realize that, right. but Abraham first heard that he would be exceedingly fruitful, and he thought like the Christian church thinks about the letter of James. I gotta, I gotta make myself fruitful. I gotta prove I have faith. Right. I gotta prove I'm the father of many nations. You know how I'm gonna prove it? I'm gonna make myself an heir. And he went off and had a what? An Ishmael. Right. And God's like, all right, we have mercy and compassion on Abe. We can tell Abe's heart is for us. But my man Abe come from an idol-worshiping nation. And so my man Abe is a little confused. We're going to make it real clear. We're going to wait till the seed that's in him dries up. Because Sarah, or Sarai, couldn't conceive. Her womb was already dead. But Abe, he could still bring forth seed. And so he was confused, thinking, I'm going to be the one that's going to have to bring forth the fruit. And then I'll justify myself by my ability to produce fruit. Isn't that how we describe the letter of James? Mm -hmm. That made Abe a forgetful hearer. And so God's like, there's 17 years in between there, right around 17 years. And so God's like, all right, we're going to wait for Abraham's seed to dry up within him right. to where he can't, he can't, he can't impregnate nobody and Sarah can't have no children. We're going to wait to then. And so God waits to then. And that's when he comes. Wow. I am El Shaddai. I am the all-sufficient one. I promise you, Abraham, right? He's making it real clear. And now, it, oh, yeah, I can't have kids. You were telling me to go and bring forth seed. You were telling me you would bring forth seed. Oh, right? Yes. God did the same thing to us. He come to all of us and said, I promise you, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. Right? Mm -hmm. And now where are we? We must make ourselves exceedingly fruitful so we can prove we have faith. What? <laughs> We're like Abe. And we got a bunch of Ishmaels. Do you, do you notice how Abraham did produce fruit? It just wasn't God's fruit. So I promise you, I can use my works and bring forth something that actually looks good to the world. I, I still remember this day, Bertie was preaching at a minister's conference. And he was preaching that Jesus was the time. And one of the guys stands up in the middle of the conference, don't you speak ill of the thing we've used to get this big building. And the building looks nice. You know what Bertie said? You mean your fornication with that guy? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You can fornicate with your own ability, and you can bring forth a thing that looks kind of good. Yeah. It just ain't of God. <laughs> right? right? It can even look good to the carnal line. And so that's what Abe was busy with. That's what we have been all busy with. We were forgetful hearers. We didn't remember the word of promise that God promised us he would make us fruitful and that he did a work that if we would behold our lives in the face of the work that he did, then we would find fruit coming out of us, left and right like gangbusters. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? It's the fruit of life. Do you know when it comes forth? When you behold your, your life in the face of Jesus, you start to feel happy. You will always judge your life as being very good. Do you ever notice when you think your life is very good, you feel happy? Yeah. You, ever no, you ever notice when you think your life is not very good, you feel like a wretch? Right? Yes. You ever notice that? Yeah. Well, guess what happens if you're only, only ever beholding your life in the person of Jesus? You can only ever come out with the conclusion that your life is very good. Even if around you is hell. Yeah. You'll say, but there's my life. Oh, my life is very good. <laughs> right? Peace. Patience. Right? Joy. Love. That's why Jane would come and say in chapter 2, if you love, then you do well. What's he saying there? He's saying, if you have love born in your heart, then that means you've done the good work, which is to continue in the perfect law of liberty. Because if you behold your life in the face of Jesus, then you're going to find love manifesting in your heart. Right? Why we twist that one around. Oh, we, man. We, oh, man. I, I just, just got to be honest. Because James <laughs> is Jewish, and he's writing to Jewish people, they got, a thou they got thousands of years of terminology that they use, mm -hmm. of, of Jewish idiom. Slang, things that mean specific things to them. 
right? Well, we're Gentile people, and then we just come and start trying to read it. Not only that, those, all those Jewish words and Jewish phrases and slangs, they're translated in Greek, not Hebrew. And so if I'm just being honest, James is one of the most difficult letters for a person to be able to actually get what's written there unless they really study and they really have a foundation, right, of what's going on there. Martin Luther even said that he thought the letter was not inspired and that it should be removed from the Bible because he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't reconcile, right? He didn't understand the faith. It's the faith. So James kind of says, if you have love born in your heart, you've done well. What is the do well? Blessed in your deed that he just said in the previous verses. What deed? Doing the word. What word? The perfect law of liberty. Because if you continue to behold yourself in the face of Jesus, your heart will be flooded with love. Right? That's what he's talking about there. Right? And then he goes into Abraham. How it wasn't just that faith was presented to him. He had to do the work of continuing in the faith, right? That's when he says, even the devils believe God exists. It's not enough to just say God exists, guys. You have to behold your life in the work of Jesus, right? And so you can never understand chapter two if you don't really get a firm foundation of chapter one, right? And if you don't understand what he's talking about there, notice he uses the word, Doer of the word, chapter one. And he also uses, they have done the work. Notice how he he has both those words in chapter one. And blessed in your deed. All those things in chapter one. And he defines all those things in chapter one as to what? Continue in the perfect law of liberty. They didn't just hear it. They continued in it. Right? They, They looked into the perfect law of liberty, saw they were not the old man who was but dust. But they were the new man whose life was the substance of God, right? Mm -hmm. And then they continued in that word, right? Right. And so James is making the point to these guys. He's not making the point about how you prove you have faith. He's making the point about what makes faith alive in you. Well, there's the faith. It's powerless to bring forth love in my heart if I don't continue in it. Right? If I see that I'm not the earthly man, but I'm the heavenly man, and I continue to live in the earth as if the tribulation in the world can steal from me, then that faith will be powerless to bring forth love in my heart. Right? Right. Now, the faith was not powerless in Abraham's heart because he continued in it. Right? Mm -hmm. He continued in it. Mm -hmm. Rahab, the faith was not powerless in her heart because she continued in it. So James is making the point, this faith over here that was made flesh in Jesus, that faith, that thing, that word is powerless to bring forth fruit in you if you don't continue in what it says. And there is a word. That's the whole point he's making there. And then he goes to Abraham. Abraham did the work. What work? I I try to go into a lot into the work of Abraham. Right. Right? Jesus told the Pharisees, well, if you were the seed of Abraham, you would do the work of Abraham. Well, the carnal mind has come and said the work of Abraham is that he was going to sacrifice Isaac. So do you think Jesus was telling the Pharisees they got to go sacrifice their firstborn? <laughs> no. Right. No, remember Jesus said my words are spirit and they are life. Yes. So we think there's a spirit behind what went down with Abe. Yes. What is the spirit there? But we keep wanting to read it carnal. They didn't have the law. Abe didn't have the law of Moses. So Jesus wasn't saying, you're not performing the works of the law like Abraham was. What is it that Abraham got right? He continued in the word that his sufficiency to appear as the father of many nations and to be exceedingly fruitful was of the arm of God and not his own arm. He continued in that word, right? That's the point James is making. Why is he making that point? Because these Jewish guys that he come upon, they had not continued in that word. Tribulation came, they felt a pressing in upon them, then they felt a desire for life. Sure. Don't we all feel a desire for yes. life when we encounter mm-hmm. tribulation? That's a right sign. There's nothing wrong. There's right. There's nothing wrong with feeling that. I don't like that, and I want life. The question then becomes: what are you gonna do when that happens? That's when James goes into lust. And when lust is conceived, then sin comes forth. So tribulation came to these guys. They wanted peace. They had a longing for peace, but they didn't look to what God did 
or God's work to find peace manifested in them. They started looking at how can I fix my own life? They didn't look at the life God built for them. They said, how can we build ourselves a life? And then they started living that way. That's why it says, have not respect of persons when it comes to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? You've made yourself a transgressor if you're treating the rich people better than you're treating the poor people. And why would you treat the rich people better than the poor people? Because you were having hard times and you were trying to deliver yourself from the hard times. Right? Yeah. It's like with me. When they stole the air conditioners off the church, it was a hard time for me. Because, you know, I'm already thinking, how, I mean, we're living with my parents. I'm thinking, how's my wife? How am I going to provide a life for my wife? And then they still, it was a very hard time for me. And I was busy thinking that my life is being overcome. My life is being destroyed all because of the church building. You know, how are we going to have church? Right. We didn't have church for five or six weeks, I think. Right, right, right. I was very stressed out thinking we're going to die. Hath God really said you should come here and preach? What are you doing, bro? <laughs> and listen, if I would have tried to deliver myself in that moment, do you know what would have happened? I would have come with some, you must tie 10% teaching in order to be blessed by God. And I would have started seeing the people that had money in a different light than the people who didn't have money. Because I would have seen the people who had money as being the ones who could deliver me from this great death that I'm dying. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's why James says, have not respect of persons with the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Don't you know that God has chosen the poor, rich in faith? Don't you know that prosperity is not defined by worldly measures? It's defined by do you possess eternal life or not? Yes. Well, don't these rich people possess eternal life and the poor people? Aren't they the same then? Yeah. Aren't they equally as valuable to God? Yes. Aren't they equally beautiful to God? Right. That's why James would say in the first chapter, um, let those that are rich rejoice in that they're brought low. Let those who are poor rejoice in that they are exalted. What he's saying is those who are rich, let them rejoice that in the fact that they can see that their riches can't give them life, right? Let the poor rejoice in the fact that them not having money can't keep them from life, right? Yes. And it, 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 boom. That's right. You see I that? What you were saying, like, it's enough to be co-heirs yeah. and not yes. working your way into these right. spiritual blessings, right. you know? A good question to ask yourself, like Phil just points out, is can you be content? Can you actually be content if you think somebody else has a better reward than you? <laughs> no. You can't. What, where does contentment come from? Contentment is the fruit of thinking, I have all things. That's true. There's nothing higher or greater than what I have. That's, contentment's like a dirty curse word in America. I mean, I listen, I used to talk with some American Christians on Facebook, they would get so upset when I used the word content. <laughs> like it was an evil cuss word, yeah. right? Oh, are you saying you're lazy? Yeah, right. What are you talking about? See, see the whole foundation is crooked. Yes. If your labor is born from trying to attain to something, listen, bro, <laughs> that is what it means to be a glutton and lazy, right? Paul said he labored more abundantly than them all, yet he was content. Well, where was his labor born from? It wasn't born from thinking, what can I attain to? No. His labor was born from being arrested by the love of God, yes. right? He was taken captive by the love of God. Just like Paul come and said, you can be a slave to sin or you can be a slave to righteousness. When you begin to walk in what? Newness of life. When you walk in newness of life, that will take your members captive to life. Yes. And you'll become a slave to righteousness. In the same way, if you walk in the oldness of death, death will sting your heart. It says the sting of death is what? Sin. Death will sting your heart. It will take you captive, and you'll become a slave to sin, meaning all the fruit that comes out of your life is the fruit of death, the fruit that comes forth from the foundation of I lack some good thing that I need. You can never find something beautiful born from the thought of I lack some good thing I need. That thought will always produce something after it that is corrupt, yeah. either in you or outside of you, right? Because it will bring forth actions out of you to try to satisfy the lack you feel. And those actions will be the strength of the arm, the strength of the flesh. I've seen in my life over and over again when I felt lack, 
or somebody's coming against me or taken away from me or my good names me or my reputation or you try to do something about it it's never pretty what you try to do about it <laughs> it's never pretty what comes out after that i promise you man it's just not most specifically you know in the past it mostly happens with my wife because that's who you see the most sure right yeah if your wife feels hurt. Like the thing for me is I never want my wife to feel hurt. <clears throat> I never want my wife to have a bad go. Of it. And I grew up believing that if she's having a bad go of it, that means I suck. And so whenever she would have a bad go of it, I would already be thinking that I suck. That her bad go of it is a count of me sucking. Here, right. Well, then if she just come and say something to me about her bad go of it, man, it ain't too long before I'm taking it personally. Right. And then after I'm taking it personally, what do you think I'm trying to do? Defend how I've done the good and the right thing, sure. right? How do you think that came out of me towards her? Do you think it was the peaceable fruit of righteousness? <laughs> I promise I you it was so not. Right. It was me trying to justify <laughs> myself. Whenever you're trying to justify yourself in any dynamic, the fruit that's coming forth is not going to be the fruit of life, right? right? And we ought not be ashamed of it. We don't need to feel like we suck because it happens, but we just want to understand. We just want to have understanding about the life that we, that we live and move and have our being in the spirit of God's life. And then we want to see the life that's in the world and how that life looks living and moving and having its being. Because I promise you, the more you start recognizing it, you walk in discernment and you begin to discern things. It's like everything becomes like the matrix. Have you ever seen the movie The Matrix where it just looks like all those things? And then all of a sudden at the end, he could just see it all. And it just all starts falling into place. And then he could just start doing all these things that were seemingly outside of possibility. That's why Jesus walked around doing what he did. They asked him for the temple tax. And what does he say? Go and catch a fish out of the water and take a coin out of its mouth and we'll pay the tax that way. Do you see how he's living in the dynamic of the law of the spirit of life? Just like we're living in gravity. He was living and having his being, moving and having his being within the spirit of God's life. Yes. Right? right? The baskets. Just take the food. He did not see lack. You see, we all saw lack there. Yes. We tend to see the lack. Right. He saw abundance. Right? right? I am abundance. I am life. I'm like a river of living water standing here. Here I am. I'm like a geyser gushing, right? And he knew that what was in him. And it, it made everything look different to him. Sure. And he lived the moon as had his being within the power of the new man. And that's why he could tell the disciples that you believe that you can pass his mouth into the sea. It, it'll be done for you. Not saying that you would literally do that, yeah. but that you living and having your being without lack you'll find yourself you know producing whatever mountain looks to be in your yeah, way will be far removed. removed you won't see a mountain there you'll That's see the right. thing level absolutely right yeah. the thing will be leveled in your eyes yeah. you begin to look at things differently listen like five years ago i'd be really stressed out right now because i gotta preach like a lot of messages and i have not had any time to prepare any of these messages and listen, five years ago, I'd have been stressed out thinking if I hadn't got the Sunday message done by this time, right? I've got like 30 messages I'm trying to pull together. And I can't just grab messages I've preached in the past because I don't know if you guys realize it, I've built the foundation here. So I can't just walk into a yes, group of people exactly. that have no foundation in anything I say and just, Bleh! I, I got to like grab stuff and put stuff together that these people can follow me right. or they can just be totally lost. Right. Right? I gotta be honest, I don't feel stressed out at all. Today, I didn't even feel like working on it. And I started thinking, is there something wrong with me, Ward? Did I feel peace? <laughs> like all is well? Who's I mean, God, man. You to prepare the exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I mean, you know, it's almost like you get to the place where you think, is there something wrong with me that I'm not <laughs> concerned about this? Because yeah. it seems unnatural, yeah. right? Because we even think that it's that we're so concerned about it, that's what brings forth the good fruit. Right. If we're real stressed out about it, if we're really worried about it, that's what's going to bring out a good outcome. Right. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but for me, if I don't feel worried about it, sometimes I think there's something wrong with me. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 you're just like experiencing the God life more and more and more. And it looks so contrary to the Adam life, right? right? Yeah. It looks so contrary. Totally. 
Like it, it seems so antithetical, mm -hmm. right? right? So that's what the letter of James is talking about. He's talking about the two wisdoms. If you even keep reading, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God who gives liberally. But he says, don't ask from the lust in your heart, right? Don't ask from the position of lust. Don't ask for wisdom thinking you're going to work your wisdom to get the riches in the world that you want so you can feel happy about your life. Because that's you lusting to build yourself a life, right? God's built us all a life. He set that life before us, clearly in the man Christ Jesus. Yes. The perfect law of liberty is to continue to behold ourselves in the life that God built for us. If we continue in that life is our life, we're doers of the word, we have done the work. That life is full of power to bring forth its fruit in us. We'll be blessed in the deed of continuing to behold our life in his life, right? But if we continue as if the life we have is in the world and we're trying to build ourselves a life in the world by our own works, then that means we're forgetful hearers. And we're trying to find peace by how beautiful of a life we can build for ourselves, right? And then we're forgetful hearers. And then that will cause sin to come out of us, i.e. the works of the flesh, self-justification. That doesn't mean it's bad to work hard and for things to go right. Mm -hmm. You can work very hard and things can go right. You don't want to hear what I just said with the carnal mind and say that it's evil to work hard or have nice things. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. But it is evil if you think you can have peace by the nice things you can get. Right. That's the part that's evil, mm -hmm. right? right? Because the peace of God is not subject to whether you have nice things or not. It's not weak, right? right. If God's life is subject to the world system, then man, we're worshiping the wrong thing, yeah. right? We might as well abandon it all now and I'll start getting busy trying to work real hard, right? But that's exactly what the church does today. Yeah. You know, seven steps to this, 10 steps to that. It's all, it's worshiping the world. It's good advice. That's yeah. all it is. It's good advice. All right. It's yeah. good advice to navigate the world, some of it, yeah. right? But uh, listen, a long time ago, I decided I'm really, well, good advice, glory to God. Um, but what I decided a long time ago is that I wanted the peace and the love and the joy and the kindness and the meekness and the patience of God. Right? Yeah. That's what I decided a long time ago. Like Paul talked in his letter to Timothy, he talked about those that will be pierced through with many sorrows, supposing that gain is godliness. Yeah. Supposing that what they could gain in the world was the evidence of godliness. And then Paul went on to say, let your heart be fixated or set on eternal life the peace and the love and the joy of God. Let your mind be filled with the peace and the love and the joy and the kindness and the meekness of God. Let that be what your heart pursues. Let it pursue the word of eternal life because godliness is found in that. That's why he went on to say, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, if you struggle when you read James, don't stress yourself out, right? It's not really worded in a way to help you out. Yeah. <laughs> Neither have you been taught in a way that will help you out. Right? You've been taught in a way, it's like I come in today, it's like I show up on Sunday and tell you guys all of a sudden, no, 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 the plus sign is actually a subtraction <laughs> sign. And now we got to go back and rewire everything you've thought with the changing of the sign. It can be like, feel like you're shoving a circle into a square peg for a while. Take a deep breath, relax, talk with God, start getting the definition of words down. If you notice, we did a whole lot of that in the beginning of the church. Like everyone in the church knows the word sin is not really talking about behavior. It's talking about a wisdom. It's talking about a belief, right? That's the primary meaning of sin. If you look in the letter to Romans, the word sin that's used 47 times, 46 times, it's a noun, not a verb. Right. Well, if you just read the book of Romans thinking that word sin there is talking about bad behavior, you're going to struggle to understand anything there. Right. Right. Same thing with the word faith. The word that's used for faith in the New Testament, 90 something percent of the time, it's a noun. When it talks about us believing, the word belief is used. 
right? Like, like, what are the works of God that we might work them? What did Jesus say? Believe, Believe. on the one that he sent, yeah. right? Yeah. And so you can weigh that out and you could go and look, well, is this word faith here talking about a noun or is it talking about a verb, right? What's the point of what he's saying here? Is it the faith or is it my faith? Now, we have to believe on the faith in order to be saved. But what are we believing on? We're not believing on our own faith. We're believing on the faith of God. It's God's faith that saves us, right? right? right. You know, when you were talking about the path of, of looking at sin as being the behavior or the action that you do, you know, I, <laughs> I had to like get into a little bit of it with a, a friend of mine that was, again, you know, calling the Torah, okay, the lamp. So, of course, it went into the, you know, five virgins with their lamps. And, you know, they all have the Torah, but only five of them were obedient and had oil. So all of a sudden they equate oil to obedience, and I'm going, what? <laughs> I said, how did, how did you come to that leap? And, uh, and, and I, I sit there and I'm, I, I watch it all unfold, how, yeah, you get, you get the understanding of it wrong. That, that this oil is, is something that they worked up. And, and I've kind of gone, no, every description I've seen of the anointing of the oil it comes from God, not from the work of someone's hand. Yeah. And, you know, he, he kind of he didn't have anything to say to that. What you could say is they use the word obedient, and so you can keep in mind if you feel led, you could try and guide them into considering what obedience is. Like, I've done a bunch of messages here about obedience. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to obey God from the heart? Remember, I did a whole message yeah, about what does it mean obey. to obey God from the heart? Jeez. And so Paul called obedience the obedience to the faith, faith, right? Now, the faith says, not by strength of my hand, by strength of God's hand, I'll have eternal life. You know what happens if I agree with that faith? You're obedient. Or I allow myself to be persuaded? I am obedient. Mm -hmm. Just not in the sense that we think carnally of obedience. Right? You know what happens once I believe that? I'm anointed with oil, the Holy Spirit. Right? right? right. And so it's, not, it, it's that their understanding of these terms and how to express them is a little off. Right? right. Yeah. And so the word faith, it actually speaks of being persuaded of something by someone else. The Greek word in the root, it means for someone else to come and persuade you of something. Now, how would you be obedient to that? Like, allow yourself to be persuaded. Allow yourself to be persuaded. And contrary-wise, do you know what the word disobedience in the Bible means in the Greek? To refuse to be persuaded. The children of disobedience. Do you know what that means? Those that refuse to be persuaded. Persuaded by what? The faith. Right? And so disobedience and obedience are real terms used in the Bible, but they're speaking of belief, right? They're speaking of a belief. Like Jesus said, I didn't come to clean up the outside of the cup. I come to clean the inside of the cup. First make inside the cup clean, and then the outside will become clean after. And so whenever Jesus is thinking about a person's behavior, he's, he's not thinking of, they must obey me telling them not to behave that way. He's thinking of there's a belief in their heart that's producing this fruit. I need to come to persuade that belief out of their heart and plant a new belief. And then that will make clean the outside of the cup. Right? And we see it backwards. Like go and sin no more. Right? The woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. Listen, do you guys know what adultery means, spiritually speaking? It would be similar to idolatry. It would exactly be idolatry. What was the adultery of Israel? It, it talked over and over about how they committed adultery on God. Do you think that's talking about they wouldn't physically have sex with somebody else? No. No. They, they worshiped false gods. They were intimate with their own works. They fornicated with their own flesh. Mm -hmm. So what was the woman caught in? The act of adultery. adultery. So what is that talking about? She fornicated with her own works. She was intimate with her own works, trying to give herself life, right? And so Jesus comes and says, 
go and sin no more. He just finished saying he doesn't judge anyone after the flesh. So do you think that when he says go and sin no more, he's talking about something she's doing outwardly, or is he talking about something she's believing inwardly? Inwardly. Now, what was she believing? That's the big question. Now, here's where humans struggle. The whole book of John is about no one knew God as Father. No one knew God as Father. Guess what that means? We were all living like we were orphans. We were all living in the earth like we were bereft of a father who would care for our lives. Do you know what happens when you think you don't have someone to care for your life? You begin trusting in your own works to care for your life. John 1 starts off with, no one has known God or the Father but the Son. He has come to what? Declare him. So why would that woman be intimate with their own works? Because she thought she was an orphan in the earth. That's John 8. Jesus comes and says, go and sin no more. You know what he would be saying? Go and know God is with you as Father. And he is here to remove the sentence of death that's hanging over your head. He has come to condemn that which is condemning you. God is with you as Father to remove the accusation, to remove the condemnation, to stand next to you as your advocate and defend your name, defend your honor, defend your integrity. Go forward and know this day forward that you're not an orphan. God is your Father. Mm. Right? So go and sin no more. Hold on. He keeps building it. Mm. You get to John 14, and what does he say? I'm going to be leaving soon, right. but don't worry. I'm going to send another one like unto me, the comforter. Right? Yeah. I will not leave you what? Comfortless. You know what it was like when Jesus was there with them? They knew God was with them. They didn't feel like orphans. So Jesus says, I'm leaving. While I was here, I am Emmanuel. I'm God with you. And while I was with you, you didn't feel like orphans. You knew God was with you to care for your life. But I'm about to go. But don't worry. I won't leave you comfortless. I'm going to send another one to you, even the comforter. Well, that word comfortless means to be bereft of a father. It means to be an orphan. And then Jesus goes on in John 16 to say what? When the Holy Spirit has come, he will what? Convince you again and again and again and again of sin. What is sin? To think that you're an orphan in the earth without a father to care for your life. Mm -hmm. So Jesus said, go and sin no more. Go and no longer believe wow. that you're an orphan. Wow. So, so go and no longer see yourself as being bereft of a father. Because the only reason you're intimate with your works is if you think you don't have a father. It's if you think you got to care. What? Why does an orphan do the things they do? I got to care for my own life. Yes. I don't have a mother or a father to care for my life. It's left to me. What was the woman caught in adultery doing? Thinking she was an orphan. And not the woman caught in adultery is not just talking about that woman. It's all of us. Yes. We're all the woman caught in adultery. We thought we had been orphaned in the earth. We thought that God come to the maternity ward and saw us naked in our sin and said, they're not mine. They don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They don't walk like me. They're not mine. That's what we all thought about God. And because we thought we didn't have a father who loved us to care for us, because we thought the guy that we thought was our father, he's actually the one stealing from us and killing us and destroying us because of our sin, we started becoming intimate with our own works. We fornicated with our own flesh, right? And then the accusation against us, right? Which is, are you really the children of God? The sentence of death that hangs over us is the evidence. Then Jesus had the stone. And at the same time, they had their, their a sin offering. There they are with the stone that they want to stone her with. And there they are holding their sin offering. So here are the, the accusers the, the, of the <coughs> world accusing her. Mm -hmm. and, but the question I have is, along that line is, why, why, what sent the accusers away? Right, because Jesus said the first one, well, without sin, cast out. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Did they understand yeah. the Father thing? Yeah, I, I think. They who understand the, the Father? The, the ones who came to stone her, well, who said, who no. were accusing the woman. They probably didn't understand anything. Well, no, right. no, no. They They're say, the accuser. But they dropped, but they dropped their stone. So Jesus, the, the light of his words pierced them. They dropped the oldest first, the ones with the most experienced first. Drop their stones. 
They, so the, perhaps the deceit of the world left them so they would not uh, have the feeling that they had toward her. They saw maybe themselves in her. I don't know. I don't think so. I think what they saw was that they had sin also. Yes. He used the law against them. Right. You want to condemn her? Let's look at you. Yeah. yeah. Whenever you find somebody stuck in self-righteousness, do you know what you do? You use the law. Yeah. If they're trying to find life by their own works, let's look at your works. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so G Jesus, you got, you got to remember, Jesus is God there. Mm -hmm. right? The whole point of, of John is Jesus is the word. He is that which was from the beginning. He's God in the flesh. Yes. He came to declare who? The Father. Yeah. So who is he declaring in the, in the woman caught in adultery? And what's he declaring about the Father? Notice the Pharisees come and said, Moses says, such should be stoned. Do you know what the implication is? Moses says? Well, Moses wrote in, in well, the God wrote in stone, gave to Moses. Jesus, um, does he look up with, with the guy that has the sin offering and write his sin on, the, on you know, look at him and write his sin? You know? I would say no. What I would say is that the implication is that God is the one that punishes sinners. Mm -hmm. That God is the one who condemns sinners. Because God's the one that gave Moses the law. And so they read the law yes. and just assumed that meant God's will was to condemn and punish sinners. Right. They assumed that that was the word of God about how God would behave towards sinners. But Jesus is standing there as what? God. The word of God, right. as God himself. And so they come and say, Moses said such should be stoned. The implication is God is the one that would punish her with sin. Right. God punishes sinners. God condemns sinners. God accuses sinners. God uncovers the nakedness of sin. And they quote Moses. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus gets down and does what? They're in the temple when this is happening. They're right. Yeah. Right. They're in the temple. So, so he writes on the temple floor with his finger. What does it say in the Old Testament about what wrote the law? The finger of God. Well, is Jesus God? Yes. yes. You, know what, you know what he's silently saying? You presume to tell me what the law says? <laughs> I am the law made flesh. In the beginning was the law, and the law was with God, and the law was God. I am the law made flesh. I am God in the flesh. I have come to declare to you the way God will be with sinners. There she is. Here I am. I don't accuse. I remove the accusation. I don't condemn. I justify. I remove death. I don't punish with death. I heal. I don't punish. I am God. That's why he stands up and says what? I am the light of the world. Yes. Well, they were celebrating Torah as the light of the world that day. Yeah. On that day, they were celebrating that. You know what he stood up and said to all those Jewish peoples? I am the Torah in the flesh. I am the word of how God will be with sinners in the flesh. Watch what I do. Right? And then he goes on. He keeps following up. Guys, notice the whole thing. He's trying to reveal the truth about God in this whole sequence. The whole point is to reveal who God is and how he is with sinners. And so he goes on and they come upon the blind guy right after that. And what do they say? Who sinned? This guy or his parents that he was born with sin? I mean, listen, how could you have sinned if you were born blind? That's right. Well, notice what Jesus says. In the Greek, he just moves it to the side. That ain't got nothing to do with this. But that you might see the work of God is to heal and not to destroy. Boom. And he restores the guy's sight. Mm -hmm. That you might know that the work of God is not to condemn or punish sinners. It's to heal and justify sinners. And then right after that, he says, for judgment, I came into the world. What judgment? To issue a decree that God is your father and you're not orphans. You haven't been left to preserve your own life. God is with you. Here I am. Here I am. You have a sin problem. Here I am. You have a life problem. Here I am. I don't condemn. I justify. I'm not the thief. I'm the good Samaritan. Now listen, right after he says, for judgment I come into the earth. To decree a decree that God is your father and you're not an orphan. That's when he goes right into what? It's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, why would you even have to say that? 
Why would you even have to say it's the thief that steals, kills, and destroys? Because they think that it's Because God. they think, and the whole church today thinks that God is the one punishing sinners. Yes. Now, I was confronted with that today. I gave Mo's book to uh, a friend. He was reading it. And then uh, about an hour later, he comes back, and I, and I hear from him, well, you, this is the Old Testament God, and the New Testament, the Old, the Old Testament God who brought, you know, fire and brimstone against Sodom and Gomorrah and did all this, and, and now the, the New Testament, and, and I said, oh, God. God. <laughs> so, well, you can give him my number. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, this whole sequence is all connected. This is not like weeks and days apart. And so now he, it's the thief that steals, kills, and destroys. And what do he say? I come that you might have life, life. and yeah. have it more, more abundantly. Now remember, he's God. So it's the thief that's been stealing from you, that's been killing you, and that's been destroying you. I'm God. Here I am. Notice what happened when I stood in your midst. There was a sinner. What happened to the sinner when they stood in my midst? They were healed. There's a blind guy. What happened when I interacted with the blind guy? Their sight was restored, okay? He's issuing a decree. I am God, and when I am come, I come to bring forth a life that abounds over sin and death. Yes. And so the whole, category, the whole thing that he's separating here is, man, notice Ezekiel in chapter 36. It says that God was going to have to sanctify his name. It says it had been blasphemed in the hearts of people. Yes. You know how the name of God was blasphemed in the heart of people? The serpent was stealing from us and killing us and destroying us, and he convinced us God was doing it. He convinced us we were orphans. He convinced us God wasn't with us. He convinced us God was ashamed of us because of our nakedness. He convinced us that God come to the maternity ward and said they're not mine. And so he got us laboring and toiling, living like orphans, fornicating with our flesh. And God come to sanctify his name in our hearts by revealing himself as what? Abba. Right? So that we could know God as Abba. And so that we would be comforted, no longer living in the earth as orphans, but living in the earth knowing we had a heavenly papa whose good pleasure was to care for our lives, preserve our lives, clothe upon us with life, justify us from everything that accuses us, condemn that which was condemning us, stand next to us as our advocate, Give right? Giving us all things freely. Giving us all things freely. God is our David. Yeah. It says Goliath was uncovering the nakedness of the Israelites. If you really are the people of God, mm. he was saying. And David shows up. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should speak against the people of God? That's Jesus. Jesus showed up in the face of the accusers. But he's God. And that we're supposed to see. That's God. And look, this guy come and stood next to me when I was naked in my sin. And he defended me. What is it you start thinking about God? This guy's full of integrity toward me. Buddy. Listen. It's nice when people are nice to you, but if they're only nice to you when you only do right, well, what kind of confidence do you have when you're in their presence? Not very much. Right. And so God come to bring forth the thing in us where we can have full confidence in his integrity towards us, even when we were without faith in him. Right? Even when we were faithless, he remains faithful. Right? Yes. And so Jesus came to reveal an image of God that would pierce our hearts and put our flesh to rest. And that only image is Father. That's why Jesus come and said, unless you become like little children, you will not be able to experience the kingdom of God. What is a little child? They're not busy thinking about how they're going to have what they need for life. They're not thinking about how they're going to get it. They're not even thinking about what they need. Somebody else is thinking about it. Somebody else is providing it. Somebody else is doing a work to get it. And they're just living and moving and having their being within the environment somebody else has created. And they're not even thinking about that kind of a thing. That's the innocence of a child. They're not carrying the burden of caring for their own life. Somebody else is carrying it. Wow. Wow. We had certain needs, guys. We needed to be defended against the accuser. Right. We needed the sentence of death to be removed from us. We needed to be clothed upon. We needed someone to defend our name, to defend our honor, to defend our reputation. We needed someone to build us a light. We needed someone to do all those things. And we didn't think we had anyone. And so we were trying to do it. And then God shows up and he does it. And then we see that he does it. Oh my God. <laughs> this guy's the good Samaritan. God's the good Samaritan. I've been busy thinking he's the thief. 
But God's the good Samaritan who, when he finds us beaten and bloodied and left for dead on the road by the thief, he doesn't walk away from us. He comes and picks us up and fills us with the wine of his life. He makes a place for us to stay in his house, and he serves us a table. Right? What did the good Samaritan do? Picked the guy up yep. and did what? Paid for him to stay in what? And in. Yeah. That's God. Yeah. That's God. He, he made a place. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you might be also. Where was Jesus when he was on the cross? Beaten and bloodied and left for dead. By who? The thief. Who came and cared for his life? The father. Jesus was being accused. Jesus was being condemned. His name was being slandered. His reputation was being attacked. Who came and stood with him and vindicated him? Abba. Why did he do all that? To tell us something. Yes. Right. Exactly. Right? Yes. So that we would go and sin no more. We would go and no longer live in the earth like we were orphans without a father. That's why. Whoa. And you see the whole dynamic with an orphan. We see the things they do. Sure. When, they're, when they think they don't have a family or someone, to, they steal, they cheat, they do all kinds of, because they're filled with all this. Oh my God, what about my life? What about, you see a child though that has two parents that are just caring for their life. They grow up free from all those heavy thoughts, right? They're busy thinking about playing. And that's it. They're not thinking about where am I going to get food from? They're not thinking about where am I going to sleep? They're not thinking about is there going to be a roof over my head tonight? They're free from all of that because someone else is providing it. Mm -hmm. yes. And they are able to live like a little child. I mean, what do we say all the time when someone encounters bad things and their childhood was stolen from them? Mm -hmm. What do we mean when we say that? They're innocent. Yeah. Right? Why do we say it? Because they were, they had to see the harsh work. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Man. You see all that? Yeah. The whole point of John is that no one knew God as Father. Because we didn't know God as Father, we were like the woman caught in adultery, fornicating with our own words. God shows up in the midst of us being accused and condemned and death hanging over us. We're naked. Here we are. God's come to kill us. That's what we're thinking. God's come to kill us. There's God. He removes the accusation. He removes the condemnation. The woman, where are your accusers? Where are those that were condemning? There are none, Lord. Neither was I ever condemning you. Right. Go and no longer live in this world like God was condemning you because of your sin. That God was the one accusing you because of your sin. That God was the one uncovering your nakedness. Go and know. That God is the one that covers your nakedness. He's the one that defends you against the thief. He's the one that clothes upon you. He's the one that justifies you. He's the one that comes and places his name behind your name to uphold your life. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. That's what he's talking about. That's what sin there is in the book of John. It's to think that you're an orphan. What did Adam think in the garden when he started? I'm an orphan. I don't have a father. If Adam thought he had somebody coming to clothe him, you think he would have clothed himself? No. no. He, he, did, he no longer knew God as father. In fact, he thought God's going to accuse, point, uncover, condemn, all those things. What does God show up and do? Clothe. Right? That's a really important question before I clothe them. That's who told you? Yes. Who told you? And the, the, the implication there is, I didn't uncover your nakedness. Man. Yes. Right. It's not me that's pointing at you and ashamed that you're naked. Adam, you were naked before, man. You needed me to clothe you before. There's nothing that's changed in my heart towards you. The only thing that's changed is in your heart about me. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. And that's what Jesus came to sanctify the name of God in our heart, yeah. to set it apart as only being filled with goodness and kindness towards people, even when he finds them dead and sin. Yeah. Right? right? That's the whole thing there. When you see God as Father, you will really find yourself resting. You bet. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the church today doesn't see any of that. I mean, that's, that's something that we've grown into, at least in our, my belief system, is being part of this you know, fellowship, is understanding and knowing God as Father. Yeah. Because before he was the big cloud off in the, you know, the never, never land, a long way away. Never his father. Yeah. That, that's huge. 
Yeah, it's like you think that he might be good to you if you've been good. Yeah. That's not father. No. That's not father. That's something entirely different. Yeah. I, every time someone went wrong for me in the world, I was convinced I was being punished by God because yeah. I didn't get it right. You know, I messed these things up, and now, you know, God's either he's taking his hands off and just let me suffer, or he's the one in, implementing the punishment, right? You'll never find the life of Je Jesus. knew it could never be God that was punishing. Jesus knew it would never be God that would punish. When he was casting out demons out of people, what did they come and say? He's doing that by the power of what? Yeah, the yeah. of love. What did Jesus say? A house That's divided right. against itself cannot stand. I cannot be the one who gives the demon and the one who sends the demon away. Now, that is a far-reaching principle of truth. I cannot be the one who gives death and the one who saves from death. I cannot be the one who condemns and the one who justifies. I cannot be the one who punishes and the one who heals. A house divided against itself cannot stand. That doesn't mean there isn't condemnation or that there isn't punishment. It just means it comes from sin and not from God. Right. Right? Yes. Sin is, it's like in basketball. They have a stat called the sit, where if you got the ball and you're driven around or whatever, and you pass it to a guy and they score right after you pass it to him, you get an assist. Right. Sin does not need an assist from God in order to bring death. That's right. And we've preached it like it does. Yes. We preach it like sin gets an attaboy from God. Like God comes and helps sin serve people with death. We sin, and then God comes and delivers the death. Mm -hmm. What the hell, man? Or allows it. Or allows it, or whatever else. Yeah, but then John comes and said, in God, there's no darkness. Right. There's no death. That's what darkness is. There's only light and light. Right. He comes and says, there's no fear in love. That means if you're actually seeing God for who and what he is and what's really in his heart, you could never feel fear. You could never actually be afraid if you knew God. It's See, not possible. What's so interesting is, like, I'm a word person. And so, but for so long, like, so I know if, if, if God's word says he's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow, he's always consistent. He's never, he will not forsake us. But yet you're taught other things. But for me, where I'm starting to realize is I put just from what we do. I mean, I, I look at everything. I look at words. I look at what they mean. And why did not look at that? Why did not see the inconsistency? Why did not see that? Wait, you're telling me that he will never forsake me. But now you're telling me he forsake Jesus on the cross. Or as I heard the other day when I was driving, <laughs> that God forsake Jesus so he wouldn't forsake us. Mm. And so it's it's kind of like unwinding all that. And it seems so simple and so in your face. Yeah. Get right in line with the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did not see that. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 We think the guy standing up there preaching knows what he's talking about and and so we but, I, but I think it comes reason. from a good heart but I guess that's what happens is you just take what somebody yeah because he's an authority believe it people can believe that this message is like the latter rain I believe it's being passed on the whole earth now by men right. that yeah. you're teaching right yeah. and I mean that's what I think we're doing yeah. so yeah. thankful but I do believe it's it's going out yeah yeah I I, I agree yeah, and, and what I what I because I've been studying um, the Book of Romans, and I think it's chapter fifteen mm -hmm. talks about you know the weaker and the strong, and don't 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 judge somebody as to how they are they're thinking, um, you know, because God God is in every church; mm -hmm. He's there, yeah. and He will bring people. So that's because you were talking about like your friend said, well, there is old New Testament, New Testament. We Greek, have five, Greek Orthodox. Yeah, we have, we have, five, we have five kids and, and, and two, you know, most of them really walk with the Lord and we have a daughter who, who just got married and she truly walks with the Lord and she has beliefs that I'm realizing now don't come from a life of freedom, but I can't unwind. I don't think that's my job to unwind it. So I just listen to her and I just know that God will bring her to freedom at her time. Yeah. with her husband in their church when they need to. Yeah, there's a difference between judging the word that's being taught and judging people. Yeah, right? talking about judging, yeah. No, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. like, I would say the majority of ministers that I meet are well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They're well, the, the large majority are well-intentioned, but that don't mean their gift is to teach the scriptures. Right. Right? And so there's a difference between well-intentioned and teaching the scriptures. 
Because teaching the scriptures is a gift that's born from above, right? Mm -hmm. It's a caris gift. Mm -hmm. It's a grace gift. Just like every other thing is a gift. And I think what you have in the church is you have a lot of people that are functioning outside of their gift, right? They're not teachers of the scriptures, and they're trying to teach the scriptures. Sure. There's something else, right? Mm -hmm. And they're functioning outside of their gift. And then when you try to function outside of your gift, you're going to get the whole thing sideways, yeah. right? Because that doesn't mean you're less than. It doesn't mean you love God less than another guy. It just means that ain't your gift, right? Wouldn't Paul say that, that, that Jesus led captivity captive and he sent it on high and gave gifts unto men, mm -hmm. some apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some evangelists, some teachers, mm -hmm. right? It's a gift, mm -hmm. right, from God. Right. And so what's happened in the church is we've kind of taken the power out of the Holy Spirit manifesting the gifts and we send people off to seminary. And we say that seminary is the power unto being a minister. And so now we're just pumping out graduates, right, who maybe aren't gifted to be teaching the word. And even if they were gifted to be ta taught the word, they were taught by people who don't know the word. Right. And so now what are we, what are we fostering now? Yeah, just yeah. yeah, it's just a cycle. They, they're taught these things, sure. right? I mean, and then we're taught those things. So and then you're taught those things. Right. And then we end up having to unwind all those yeah. things. <laughs> this is the first, one of the first things God told me. And I went to what I thought was a very good Bible college. And I remember being 25, thinking I went to a great Bible college, even knowing some of the things that we talk about here, thinking this Bible college. God come and told me to take everything I thought I knew and crumple it up in a ball and throw it in a garbage can. Wow. And that was very painful. Wow. Because I thought I knew some stuff. I thought I'd learned some stuff. And he said, Listen, man, if you don't throw all that stuff in the garbage can, you're never going to see what I'm trying to show you. Wow. And oh, by the way, don't expect that all the people you went to Bible college with and all your friends that are teachers at Bible college, don't expect them to necessarily like what you have to say. Some of it, I think, is rooted in bad teaching that people experience. But some of it is just a carnal understanding or mm. approach to things. They, they haven't really truly pursued God for the, their interpretation. They're, they're looking to themselves and to other people. That's why they're so quick to point to this teacher and that teacher, and mm -hmm. how great they are. And, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. All right. Anybody have anything they'd like to add? Anybody online have any comments? We have, we have Joe with us tonight from Australia. Oh. Joe, how's it going? Yeah. Man, what time is it in Australia right now? No, she's she's gone. Oh, she just she checked out. out. Yep, she checked. I was wondering how the fires are doing. Yeah, it? me too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it rained, so I know that helped. Yeah, it rained shortly thereafter. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the next day. Yeah. I think somebody's waving at us. Yeah, Sherry. Does everybody see the thing in James? How you want to start looking at it? The yes. faith. Right. The perfect law of liberty. Right. There, the faith can't do anything in your heart. If you don't continue in what it says, yeah. do you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same thing Paul said to the Galatians. He said, sow to the spirit. Don't sow to the flesh. What's sowing to the flesh? Trying to be justified by your own works. That's sowing to the flesh. Mm -hmm. What's sowing to the spirit? Continuing in the faith that I was crucified with Christ. I'm dead to the world and the world to me. Right? Mm -hmm. he, said, he said, Christ has become of no effect in your life. He wasn't saying they lost eternal salvation. What he's saying is, listen, man, Christ is of no effect to produce the fruit of the Spirit in you because you, you ain't continuing in the faith that I clearly set before you, right? That's when he comes and says that faith worketh by love. I know we get that verse backwards. In the Greek, what that actually says is the faith shows itself active in a person's heart by producing love. Wow. That's actually what it says there. That word faith is a noun, right? And what it's saying there is the faith that was revealed in Jesus shows itself active by giving birth to love. Now, how is that faith going to be active in me if I continue in the word that I was crucified with Christ, right? right. Yeah. Maybe, Michelle, to help, one of the things is going to, I think now, when we talked about the perfect law of liberty, Maybe if we call it the perfect law of liberation, yeah. Yeah. that really makes more sense in my mind for what we've talked about in terms of what that really is. I'm so. glad you asked that question. Well, I had I had ten pages of notes from Sunday, <laughs> and I kept writing it, but I have to have yeah. it like, like in a nutshell. What is it, and I can hold it. I love having it. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, what I'll do, listen, after every Sunday, I put my notes oh, you do? on the page. Okay. And, I'll, and so you can have the exact, now I go off on many <laughs> tangents. <laughs> and so, but that is definitely one of the things that I wrote out and I tried to make a point to stop and say it slowly. But I'll send you the link right now to the okay. notes yep. and you'll have a hard copy of my whole thought process. Okay. I'd like that too. Are you going to just post it on the page? It's on the. It's already it's on, on the page. page right? Yeah. Which page is that? Which page is that? Gospel Revolution Church the website. website. Dot com. Messages. Yeah, there's a PDF file of every message I preach, because I want people to be able to go back and take yeah. a hard look. Because look, I know I'm going fast, right? And for me, it's easier if I can read yes. and hear, and then if I want to stop and go look at the verses, mm -hmm. if I can have that right there. Exactly. Yeah, and I'm exactly. visual, so I can exactly. see it. All right, gang, we call it quits. We'll see you next week. Good night. Less great. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, glory to God. You guys yeah. don't need me. Next. Good night, all. Good night. 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 Good night.